Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting virtual experience of tour of the greater Tacoma area. I'm your guide tonight, Chris. And yes, we are exploring one of the most fabled and favorite neighborhoods of Tacoma tonight, the Lincoln District. And it's good to see you guys. I'm glad you're you're hanging out tonight. Lincoln is a fun one. I, you know, I think I've done... Oh, wow, now I have to really think about it. Have I done every neighborhood in Tacoma, either as an in-person or virtual tour? Probably. I think I'd have to go through my notes, but I'm pretty confident that's true. And Lincoln is one of the ones that's always been a favorite of mine. And traditionally, I've only led this as an in-person tour. And what blows my mind is the amount of people that show up. And I think if there was a competition, it'd be a like pretty close three-way heat between South Tacoma Way McKinley and Lincoln. So I'm I'm hoping we see that same fervor tonight. And hey, I'm glad to see you guys here tonight. So let's let's take a look at the 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 Lincoln neighborhood. If you're not from the Tacoma area, uh, the Lincoln neighborhood is just across I-5 from the the main downtown section of Tacoma. It's just south of that main downtown corridor and it is separated by I-5. And that's a defining geographical feature to the entire thing. Before it was I-5, it used to be a gulch, Gallagher Gulch. And that's like rift between Maine, Tacoma and sort of South Tacoma has divided like the McKinley, Lincoln, South Tacoma, Fern Hill neighborhoods from from new Tacoma forever, right? But that became sort of an open space where people were like, oh, you know, we could do something with this. And so in 1889, the Tacoma Land Company, which was the railroad, right, donated 40 acres of land for use as a park uh, out here in the south end of Tacoma. And it was above the tide flats. They weren't really using it for anything. And they were hoping that this would encourage settlement of the area. And what do you know? It worked. And originally they called it South Park because um, it was a park in the south of the city. <laughs> it was not their most creative name, to be sure. But in 1901, very, very rapidly after this was established, the park commissioners officially changed the name of the park to Lincoln in honor of President Abraham Lincoln. And this follows a, a long line of traditions of naming things after U.S. presidents. And honestly, it's not too unexpected. Tacoma was such a big boom town, right, that several U.S. presidents have actually visited uh, the Tacoma area over our many years. Lincoln obviously was never here in Tacoma, but uh, the affection for him was quite strong. And so they decided to name a park for him. And that really became the genesis and the anchor for the entire neighborhood. So this is of the Goldfish Pond in early Lincoln Park. Um, you can see here that the, I love that they call it Rustic Bridge. Uh, this does a good job of embodying how steep the gulch was. So you see, to even use this park, you had to take a pretty extensive staircase down into what was effectively Gallagher Gulch out of the main Lincoln Prairie Land. And then you could come into New Tacoma from there. And... In December of 1911, the city of Tacoma, uh, which were then the stewards of Lincoln Park, turned over an additional 15 acres of the park's land from that original 40 to the school district to build what is now known as Lincoln Park High School, um, affectionately known now just as Lincoln High. But that was built um, in 1913, opened in 1914, and had a cost of like almost $440,000, which in 1914 was a little bit beyond everybody's budget, but certainly not as stiff a financial undertaking as it was Stadium High School, for example. But here it is in its glory. And what's great about um, Lincoln High is that it becomes the anchor, I think. It is the visual mascot of the Lincoln neighborhood, the same way that Stadium High is for the stadium district. And it's not a coincidence that the two are rivals, but they're designed effectively by the same guy. So yeah, before any historians come sending angry emails into my into my box, 
Yes, Stadium High School was, of course, originally designed to be a luxury hotel by the firm Hewitt & Hewitt. They abandoned the project after a financial collapse in 1893, and then uh, Frederick Heath gets to finish the project for the school district. Frederick Heath gets to start Lincoln High from scratch, and he actually designs this affectionately after a college uh, in, in England. So this is designed to look like an Ivy League collegiate campus. And some of the features that are really cool about it are all pictured right here. The Drost Auditorium juts out. It's got those cool turrets right there at the top. And then, of course, the clock tower is perhaps the most noticeable feature of this entire beauty right here. But when we're talking about the longstanding rivalry between Stadium and Lincoln, I think it's worth noting that both schools were at least completed by, by Frederick Heath. And Lincoln always reminds me of sort of the mission and the undertaking of the city of Tacoma's historic preservation office, which in case you didn't know by the logo up in the corner, they are the patrons of tonight's tour. They're big advocates for making sure that there is a sense of identity and that people have access to that. And so they work with me to achieve that. And they've got this amazing write up about why they endeavor so hard for preservation. And I'm going to read it to you now. But the preservation of place uh, is important. Preservation by its very name denotes that we as a society place enough value on something to deem it worth saving for the benefit of future generations. The Atlas of Reurbanism, headed by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, outlines this concept well. We all have places that matter to us, places that define us, places that challenge us, places that bring us together and tell us our story. These places help form our identity and our communities, and they create opportunities for growth and help. And they help all of us by helping us feel more at home and explain our past and serve as the foundation for our future, which I think is really telling. And I think it's a beautiful thing in its place and really encapsulates what we're trying to do here, not just with these virtual tours, but with all historic preservation in the city of Tacoma in general. And so Lincoln is a really good embodiment of that for me because what starts is sort of a nothing throwaway, right? It was just a, a land donation that the railroad was like, yeah, yeah, I got our kids enjoy this. Um, really develops into one of the strongest and most easily identifiable neighborhoods out there. And what I think is very fascinating about the Lincoln District is that the way that it was designed is not what it was used for through the 1930s and 40s. And by the 1960s, it has a complete switch into the neighborhood that you know today. And that happens in that foundation of these structures. The, the Lincoln District, as it was built, goes on to serve a variety of purposes, and the cultural identity of it changes pretty dramatically over the last hundred years. But the, the story of the Lincoln neighborhood remains pretty contextual. So, yeah, let's, uh, let's do that. And yes, thank you, Shauna. The clock tower is pretty fantastic to see from the inside. Why don't we jump to that? If I had an in intern, I'd yell at them right now, uh, but I don't. So this is the interior of the clock tower. I got invited to take an in-person tour of this building back in, I don't know, 2018, which seems like several lifetimes ago. Um, and to, to take a tour of the school itself. And it is extraordinary, especially because a lot of those original historic elements are still in there, including this auditorium, which um, is designed to actually look taller than it is. The chairs, the seating, everything on that second level, the balcony there, is significantly shorter than it appears. But it was designed by Frederick Heath to give the appearance of elevation and grandeur without breaking the bank. And in fact, it was designed at such a time, and now that it's historically protected, you can only do so much to it, that that front row of seating up, up top there has the original historic seating, and it's not up to code anymore. Uh, so students aren't actually allowed to sit in that front row for fear that they may plummet to their death which frankly, I've dealt with high schoolers in the past. It's it's not beyond the realm of imagination. 
So here's another shot of Lincoln High School, which again opened in 1914, modeled after Eton College in England, and is the second oldest high school in the city, um, rivaled only by Stadium. And wow, don't get me started on that competition. But uh, Stadium and Lincoln become the two longest serving and oldest anchors as high schools in the city of Tacoma. And what was really cool about Lincoln is that from the moment they opened their doors, they did more than just serve as a high school. Um, they offered night classes for a variety of needs, but specifically for adults. Lincoln High offered night classes from the very first day that they opened and specialized in reading, writing, math, and then citizenship tests. Uh, for immigrants who were coming to the area, they would help with naturalization uh, and just get you to a spot where you could apply for your citizenship. And these were all offered um, just as evening courses so adults could come in and brush up on practical skills needed for being an adult, right? And the two uh, most popular were the naturalization course and shop class followed very closely by interior design. And these were not exclusive to the very early days. Programs like this continued throughout the generations. So this is a shot from 1925 when the Washington State College Extension Service offered um, annual vacation camps. So essentially like summer camps for adult women uh, to, to the Western Washington farm women. Right. And so the camp was held here at Lincoln high school with about 50 of these women representing, uh, different homes, economic communities, organizations, and they would come here and they would learn about management, about nutrition. They would learn about, um, crafting and sewing and baking. Uh, and then here they are making children's hats, Here's another one of them taking a baking course. Again, this was in July of 1925, and it was women only. They closed the entire campus to men of all kinds, and then the women slept on cots throughout the school and then just went to this, this summer camp here and learned all these skills, as well as brushing up on their, their baseball. Uh, I don't know much about this woman. I've not been able to find her name here at BAT, but I'm assuming she's about to sail that to the freaking moon. <laughs> and they, um, they've, they over the years, had a variety of things that they've offered here, not just night classes and adult advancement, but Lincoln High School is another one of the schools here in the city of Tacoma that has an indoor swimming pool so that during the inclement weather of the Pacific Northwest, you can continue brushing up on your skills. And it's just got a lot going on. And oh man, Faye, I should have guessed that you were you were a graduate of Lincoln High School. I can uh, completely understand that. As someone who's toured the attic, it is a daunting space. Uh, like the Stadium High School attic has a tremendous amount of like loft to it. But I, I've been in the Lincoln one and it's like a labyrinth trying to get around through there. And there's like all these different levels and doors that kind of lead just to like a space where you have to go through another door. And that's all kind of like cubbied off and trying to get into the clock tower. It's clock tower itself was, was a feat. Um, so, Oh, that's awesome that we got, we got family members of the, the people here out there. So this is a great question. Has the Lincoln district been gentrified as much as the Proctor district? Um, no, I don't know that any neighborhood in Tacoma has been gentrified as much as the Proctor District. And I think we've seen um, a reversal. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. But with the, the Lincoln neighborhood, what happened was over the years, it had this very strong sense of self and was really community driven. And then in the 1960s, it sort of turned into a ghost town. There was this abandonment of that 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 district for a variety of reasons and it opened up space for a, a huge movement of immigrants coming to the area and and settling there and so if you are familiar with the lincoln district today uh it's you know often uh, typified as like little vietnam or the the multicultural cultural international district for main city of tacoma because our other international district is technically in Lakewood down on South Tacoma way. And so there's just like a, a huge 
amount of Vietnamese, Mexican, Cambodian restaurants and businesses in that area. And it has become the, the strong representation of that cultural identity. And it's absolutely worth mentioning as well that the Lincoln District is the traditional um, hunting ground of the Puyallup people and that the reservation itself is still quite close to this area and that a lot of people from the Puyallup Nation continue to live and work in the Lincoln District as their as their families have done since time immemorial. So it really is a a mixed multicultural community, and I I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, but I think in the 1950s and earlier, the the black student population of Lincoln High was less than one percent, and that starting in the 1960s it boosted up to over 40 percent. So it really is one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the area. And it had like a reverse gentrification where when it turned into a ghost town, it was suddenly occupied by people coming to the area looking for, for a new way of life. Uh, also, in case anyone's curious, yes, uh, not unlike Stadium High School, there is quite a lot of underground space beneath Lincoln. Uh, this is from one of the tunnels that extends under the wings down there. And then they have a huge vaulted space as well, which really should be its all own virtual tour entirely, right? Uh, other programs that Lincoln really pioneered, Lincoln was the first high school in Tacoma to offer the, quote, behind the wheel driver training, end quote. Uh, and so in 1946, this brand new Chevy, uh, which had, don't panic, dual controls, so someone on the other side could stop in case you were going to careen into traffic, um, was donated to Lincoln by the South Tacoma Motor Company. And then they were offering driving courses here for, for brand new drivers coming out to the scene. So if you didn't want to just take your kid to the, I don't know, the Macy's parking lot <laughs> and... Uh, terrify yourself, you could send them to school and Lincoln would be happy to take care of it for you. Also, they were the proud home of the Boys Who Build welding class. And in the 1940s, uh, these two seniors, one of them pictured here, a guy named Paul Urich, um, were building um, these machines. So they were actually building electric arc welding machines um this guy and another kid named melvin nelson and they built 22 arc welders in the shop and then sold them um to either fundraise for the school or to equip the industrial art shops at the school and so between those they used it as a booster for the class and then had this really efficient trade school that they were a part of here at lincoln high and that's that's the takeaway here the pragmatism and the community orientation are the two like flagship characteristics of the Lincoln neighborhood, in my opinion. What started as a park, right? What starts as a park grows into this community that lives and dies by the community's involvement. And um, 38th is the, the arterial, which I think is a fitting term for it. It's the lifeblood of this community. And that's where you see the, the greatest things happen out here, um, including <laughs> well, the first time I saw this photograph, I thought there was a terrifying little girl on a horse standing across the street. Uh, but this is a toy. So this um, are six member, these are six members of the Lincoln High School News. And they came back to school in December with all of these toys that were broken or discarded and were donated by students, right? And, or um, like people in the community. And they went back to the school and they repaired each of these. They turned them into essentially new toys and then donated them, newly refurbished um, to children in the, in the neighborhood. So tricycles, um, cars, drums, this terrifying girl riding a horse, all of this stuff went out for their Santa's Workshop annual event. And this was in 1922. And that's, that's kind of how Lincoln rolls. Even today, one of my favorite programs that Lincoln High School does is that they have a, like a horticultural program, a gardening program where the students go and they learn about you know, botany, but then hands-on gardening. It's designed to teach you to raise plants and create crops. 
And then they use it for two purposes. One, a lot of that goes to their annual plant sale, which they use as a fundraising booster for the school and the program. But also they donate the overwhelming majority of those edible crops to people in the community. They open their doors and feed the Lincoln neighborhood through this program where the students grow and then give back, which grow and give back really should be the name of the program. If it's not trademarked, somebody get on top of it, please. Okay, here we go. I'm hoping that this is not going to come as a surprise, but yes, perhaps the most famous feature of Lincoln High School is right outside. And yes, it is, of course, the Lincoln Bowl. Um, which I already know where, where are you, Billy? That's right. Elvis, perhaps the biggest thing that happens in the Lincoln bowl is that Elvis comes and plays for everyone. 1957, September 1st, uh, Elvis Presley performs a matinee concert at Tacoma's Lincoln bowl. And he was doing this big sweep of the Pacific Northwest, uh, during like Labor Day weekend, uh, started in Spokane ended up in Portland, but he did stop here and break hearts in the Tacoma area, and he chose Lincoln for it, which I think is um, a really big nod to how important and impactful the school was. And yes, in case you're curious, don't worry, everyone. <laughs> the gyrations are just a way of expressing his inner emotions. Uh, I pulled this from the 1957 article in the, uh, I think it was the News Tribune about Elvis coming to the area. And the fact that they had to, <laughs> to warn people, they're like, don't worry. It's just some interpretive hip dance. You're, you're not in any danger. Um, I would like to say times have changed, but I don't know that that's true. So aside from Elvis, the the Lincoln Bowl really is a signature piece to this entire neighborhood because again, who are who are Lincoln's rivals? Well, it's Stadium. And Stadium High, of course, has this Stadium Bowl, the namesake of the school, the largest public amphitheater out there with this massive uh, seating capacity of over 30,000. And to compete with that, the, the Lincoln District really wants a signature piece of their own. And so in the 1930s, they start to get this movement to take some of Lincoln Park and then turn it from Wild Gulch into usable event space. And you can see in the illustration here uh, their, their plan for this. You can see how it really juts into Lincoln Park. But what they did was they effectively repurposed the gulch. And you can see the lighter coloration here extending in between Park and Yakima. And what that is, is a gulch. Uh, this was an indentation in the area that flowed out into Gallagher Gulch eventually. And it was already the perfect sort of space to build just a more uniform bowl down there and then fill it with throngs. And so they did. But uh, for those of you who know the story, of course, it took some time. Uh, originally, the bowl would seat 10,000 on concrete steps and cost 250,000. And they were trying to get it done as quickly as possible. But a little thing called World War II got in the way. And not only was there an incredible shortage of labor, but also supplies. And so it wasn't until after the conclusion of World War II in 1947 that this building project um, took off. And it was completed in September of 1948 giving the space that we would now know and recognize today. Um, fittingly enough, it became the Lincoln Bowl, even though it occupied Lincoln Gulch. They really just changed the name up a little bit there. But you can see the, the seating here, as well as on the upper portion of this photograph, the, the part of the gulch there that they sort of just smoothed out for everything. Um, you can also see on the right there, those Metro Parks buildings with Lincoln Park right there. And here they are uh, surveying in 1941, trying to get an accurate look at this whole thing. And one of the engineering marvels to the Lincoln Bowl was that they mellowed out one end of the gulch and then they capped another. So they took all of that dirt and fill from one end and then pushed it up into a berm to create 
a full rounding on the far end there. So when you look at the Lincoln Bowl today, on the northern end of it, it rises up to a crest. That's an artificial crest. The, the gulch would have continued farther on down there and would have eventually run into one of the most iconic features of the area, which is the Hood Street Reservoir. And probably a lot of you remember this um, or at least know about it. That's uh, Holy Rosary right there in the background, piercing the sky. But this was, um, well, this picture is from 1925. And the, the reservoir was used to store 13 million gallons of water and was a major part of the infrastructure for the city of Tacoma, a really huge iconic feature. You can see them stirring it up with their aerator there. And it's still there. If you look at the, the Google map of the area, that large body of water, uh, still over 13 million gallons, is uh, an active reservoir for the city. But what they did is they capped it. So if you switch it to a satellite imagery of it, you see this large barren space there. And because so many things were getting into it, right, um, they were like, well, we should cap this. So this picture is from 1900 uh, of the Hood Street Reservoir during its construction. You can see 13 million gallons is quite a significant amount. Uh, this is from, oh man, I'm trying to remember the year on this one. But again, it's the Hood Street Reservoir. Um, you can see Holy Rosary there. And then this eventually looks like this. And this is from 1961. And one of the big things that... Um, changed the Lincoln District forever bef before they capped the reservoir was the construction of the Yakima Avenue Bridge, which if you've gone to Lincoln or come back from Lincoln into Maine, Tacoma, there's a strong likelihood that you've gone over the Yakima Avenue Bridge. It's the main, I think, way to go back and forth between the two because it goes over Interstate 5. And I-5 is the big divider. It, it runs through the same path that the, the Gulch used to, but really became a, a massively divisive piece of infrastructure. When I-5 came in in the late 50s, um, it, it literally and figuratively bisected the city. And these outliers like Fern Hill or McKinley or Lincoln got separated from the rest of Tacoma and for a little while kind of just had to fend for themselves until they started to build better and better bridges. And like the Yakima one in 1961, there wasn't yet completed, but it was hot on its way. But before that time, you kind of just had to figure out how to get around on your own. And that was a problem that the city of Tacoma had been dealing with from the very start, which actually gives us one of our claims to fame. In 1869, we were the home of the world's tallest and longest exclusive bicycle bridge. It was the only bridge in the world <laughs> uh, to span a giant gulch like this exclusively for the transportation of bicycles. And did they have like a toll so that only bicycles could go across? No, but it was built for that purpose. And the uh, Tacoma Wheelman's Bicycle Club were, were the genesis of this. And they got together and they're like, guys, we need a way <laughs> to get these fixed gear bicycles from one side of Tacoma to the other without murdering ourselves. Why don't we, we put a bicycle tax out there and then create this bridge? And sure enough, they did. And it really was a marvel. So you can see just how daunting the geographic feature of Gallagher Gulch was. And they end up completing a really, in my opinion, delicious looking bridge at 127 feet high and 440 feet long. It really was like one of the wonders of Tacoma. Mm. And this is a great question. Is there a flooding problem in the Lincoln Bowl? No. Um, they've managed to create enough infrastructure around that space that it sort of sends the water uh, around it, um, which is not something that we can say for the stadium bowl, interestingly enough. Uh, I often joke that when it's a heavy enough rain, you could ride a kayak down the stairs of the stadium bowl down to the base there. But to the best of my knowledge, Lincoln doesn't have quite that same problem there. Let's see if I can switch you guys back here to the bicycle bridge really quick. 
<laughs> so here it is. And this is uh, an article from 1956 talking about the bicycle bridge. And unfortunately, it didn't last. Um, you can see here the article where the decision was made uh, to eventually destroy the bicycle bridge just because it wasn't uh, needed as much. And they replaced it with a little bit different infrastructure there. And I'm trying to remember the exact year on that. But what it came down to was that the bridge was in a level of disrepair that was going to cost $800 to repair it or $250 to tear it down. And they're like, well, that's an easy decision. And down it came. And it's an outlier because it was one of the like prominent historical constructions, right? That really identified the Lincoln district. And quite a few of those from that period ended up going away. One of the only ones that actually remains is this one. <laughs> so this is a picture of 1931 Cavalry Presbyterian Church. Um, originally, this was constructed in 1886. And then <laughs> in 1909, the congregation got together and they're like, we'd like some better sunlight. And they had a better plot. So they lifted this sucker off its foundation and moved it a few blocks down to where it remains today. <laughs> So if you go down um, onto D Street in, in the Lincoln District, you'll see this church where it is now. Uh, this picture is from Google Maps not, not too long ago. Last time I was out here, it pretty much looks exactly the same. And you can see really the biggest change was um, putting the door on the side and then removing that sort of decorative section there um, in the bell tower creating a little bit less of a belfry. And to the best of my knowledge, um, the Presbyterian Church never had a bell. They constructed the belfry with the intention that they might someday buy one, but I don't think it ever happened. Well, we've, we've discussed a lot about Lincoln High, but really um, the neighborhood and the zeal is, is what keeps it going. And that's represented by, you know, them getting together here and creating the Lincoln statue. Uh, they hired a local artist, and then <clears throat> on Memorial Day of 1924, they had a big ceremony here where they placed the floral wreath at the foot of the school statue, and they all came out and had a big party for it. And then that sort of Lincoln zeal, both for President Lincoln and for the neighborhood itself, are sort of a competing passion for the neighborhood throughout the years. Um, so one of the things that you see a ton in Lincoln are parades, floats, public celebrations, and street fairs. And this particular one's from 1953 for the Daffodil Parade. Uh, of the various areas where the Daffodil Parade goes through, right? It's like Stadium, downtown Tacoma, Puyallup, and right downtown in the Lincoln District. They're sort of the, the cornerstones to the, the Daffodil Procession. And people come out for this and the floats are bananas. Like everyone goes the extra mile for this. And there's a ton of Lincoln pride in it. And everything that I've ever seen about it is always about local boostership. Even now, uh, the Lincoln district is really the like major champion of shop local shop small. And uh, the things that they've done over the years are some of my absolute favorites including this. So while the Depression era was hard on a lot of places, Lincoln took this as an opportunity to kick it into the next gear. And so in 1939, um, they began, I think for the first time ever, the Lincoln District Turkey Derby, which involved the first time 30 turkeys. Um, I'm going to say coaxed. You could say driven. You could say terrorized by jockeys. And they got their their turkeys and they pushed them down the street essentially from g street to yakima all down 38th and then um people would like bet on it they would come out and root for their favorite turkey and each one right like number 13 sure spicy here is sponsored by a different local business uh People were encouraged to dress up, particularly the jockeys, including this guy on the right here wearing what I can only describe as fabric stitched together with the threads of nightmares. 
<laughs> um, and then they rally their turkeys down the street and then see who wins. <laughs> and then um, people come down to behold this spectacle and then they shop, they eat, they indulge, they go out and they dump a bunch of money back into the local community and they think to themselves, wow, Lincoln is great. Nobody else is running a herd of turkeys down the street. And that's true. Um, the first time they did this, and again, they ran these turkey derbies through 1949, I think was the last time I've seen that one was done. Um, over the years, each time, approximately 3,000 spectators showed up. And then they were not only excited to see these turkeys run down the street, but then they would also be given turkeys. So of the turkeys that competed, they would be given to bystanders. It was up to you how you transported your turkey home. Though, based on my personal experience with turkeys, I have to assume it went something like when the Dilophosaurus kills uh, Dennis in Jurassic Park. I hate it, and I would never want anything like that inside a car with me. But <laughs> uh, they weren't just terrorizing barnyard fowl to, to raise money for the community and bring some interest to the Lincoln neighborhood. They also did things like the pet parade. So this is a particular shot from 1947, uh, sponsored out here by Hogan's Fine Foods, which those of you with a passion and an affection for the Lincoln district must know Hogan's. It's one of the uh, historic structures that's still down there today, while it's no longer a grocer. It served a long watch down there in the Lincoln District, providing food for the people in that area. And they they participated in and sponsored a lot of things like this, uh, including the, the pet parade. And this kid is not a winner of anything other than just the, the cutest kid in the area. I assume the pipe he's holding belongs to the bulldog but I'm not sure. It was 1947. Times were rough. <laughs> uh, another one of the pet parades that we've got photographs from, thanks to the Tacoma Public Library, is uh, this one in 1947, in which uh, Karsten's Custom Meats uh, and Karsten's Dog Food, uh, which, if you're not aware, is a local enterprise. Uh, you can go back through there their literature, if you will, and they did everything right down in the Tide Flats, Port of Tacoma. They would essentially take hogs and then, what do you call it? It's not blanching, but, you know, uh, boil them and then use them for a variety of things, including fine cuts, custom meats, um, a variety of other subpar products. And then what was left over was turned into Karsten's Fine Dog Foods. And during the pet parade, they were actually running the Lucky Dog Slogan Contest, where not just people in the Lincoln District, but everyone was given the opportunity to send in their, their slogan for Karsten's Lucky Dog Food. And then they handed out cash prizes. And I've seen that story all over Tacoma. I feel like every major you know historian or news source in Tacoma has some affectionate tale about uh, Karsten's Lucky Dog Food running this contest back in the 1940s. But I had never seen what the winners were. And let me tell you guys, I had to dig deep for this. But you're welcome. Here are the top five slogans for the 1947 Karsten's Lucky Dog Food uh, competition. Somehow, Lucky Dog, best pointer to peaky value won a hundred dollars and i am still flabbergasted by that <laughs> especially when something like lucky dog take a bow you're the doggy's favorite chow gets subjected all the way down to third prize like who was judging this i'm i'm disappointed so if you guys <laughs> can come up with a better karsten's lucky dog food slogan put it in the comments please let me know i will rate them entirely subjectively myself but I think we can do better than these top five. In fact, I can almost guarantee that any one of us can do better than these. But this highlights an important part of the Lincoln District's identity, that it has always been this tight merging between the community 
and local businesses. And between the two, they managed to create this sort of symbiotic relationship, I think, where they were able to exist and prosper. Not just because these local businesses put a lot of infrastructure, time, and money back into the community, but it really gave the Lincoln area a sense of identity. And when you go through and you look at the, the timeline for Lincoln, when Tacoma's at its worst, Lincoln's at its best, you know, uh, and that's really represented nicely here with their booster drives in the 1930s. During the Great Depression, uh, Lincoln was rising to the occasion to create opportunities and events for people in the area, and they were doing so with pizzazz. They were also continuing to offer those night classes for, for adults in the area. So if you wanted to further your trade skills or learn something new or be able to provide for your family differently, there were opportunities to go and take a night class at Lincoln High and, and, and do that. And then that's where you start to see 1930s through the 1950s, this like explosion of, of local businesses. Some of the most famous, of course, are Lincoln Electric. Uh, this picture is from 1952 and with the iconic silhouette of Abraham Lincoln up there and those giant plate glass windows showing off everything that the future could afford. But also um, Lincoln Hardware, you know, uh, this is a picture from 1950 in front of Lincoln Hardware with uh, community boosters. This was the Lions Club of the area out just doing street cleanup for Lincoln area. But Lincoln Hardware, which was an icon for the area until it closed very recently, was opened in 1947 by J.B. Feist. And then he passed it on to his son as a local business, who then passed it on to his children so three generations of the Feists ran and operated Lincoln Hardware right down there in the Lincoln District. And it was truly like, oh man, it was iconic, right? So yeah, uh, when, they, when they recently closed down, it was devastating, right? Um, some other places that changed the landscape, both with their opening and their closing, was Lincoln Bank. Uh, when Lincoln Bank was constructed in 1925, it was a community bank and was rated as one of the safest banks out there. Um, and it continued to operate as like the iconic bank of the neighborhood for a really long time. Another place that put Lincoln on the map was actually the Rex Theater. And I feel like every solid neighborhood in Tacoma had a good theater that came in in the early 1900s. A lot of them were like vaudeville spaces that then ended up going on to become projection theaters uh, or did live shows. The the uh, the real art, the Blue Mouse are all great examples of that. But in Lincoln, it was the Rex. And this opens in 1919. And the, the owner operator, this guy named Martin Steffen, was one of those geniuses and uh, there's only two of these theaters in all of Tacoma that I know about, but they included the nursery section. So if you were a new mother and you wanted to go see a movie with your child, you could go in and they had this like soundproof booth where you could still see the screen and it would project the sound in, but nobody in the theater could hear your child if they were screaming, for example, or if you needed uh, privacy to feed them. So it was really a revolutionary thing. And like, man, yeah. If you could create a space where, where new parents could take their young children to see a movie, uh, it would make millions right now. Oh, it's called Netflix. There you go. It's done really well. Um, so there's a few more shots because the Rex continues to be there today, though it changed pretty dramatically over time. Uh, while it was opened in 1919 and had just the, the state of the art interior here, like, look at this really gorgeous. And it actually reminds me quite a bit of, um, what you would experience at the, the blue mouse, the one that's in the Proctor district today. And you can even see in the back here, uh, those, those viewing booths at the very back of the theater there, but it didn't always have a, a glorious history. 
unfortunately, for a while there, after it closed as a theater, it was reopened, I think, in the 1960s or 70s um, by a businessman out of Seattle, of course, whose whole shtick, right, was that he would show up by failing theaters and then turn them into schmutt uh, porn theaters. And that's what happened to the Rex. It became the Playtime Rex. And there was such an outcry of community members in the Lincoln District who were like, uh-uh, not our theater, not our neighborhood. Get gone, you Seattle devil. And it closed forcefully. And then they replaced it with a church. Um, so today, the Rex is closed. Uh, this is what it looks like pretty, pretty currently. And uh, it was, up until most recently, Restoration Christian Ministries, which I think is the perfect title for a, a former porn theater changed into something new. Uh, reborn, if you will. Other iconic places that showed up down here in 1946, the Lincoln Bowling Alley, perhaps the most famous in the area, was built um, by Stanford Hogman, or Hodgman which is always hard for me to say, uh, and then operated personally by him uh, from 1946 until 1955. And it was awesome by everything that I've read because it was open seven days a week, noon to midnight, and it was air conditioned. So um, if you were like, oh man, we got to get out of this heat, where are we going? To the jazzy joint, you would go down to Lincoln Bowling. And it was nestled, obviously, right down there on 38th with the rest of the major businesses, but was surrounded sort of in that like burger joint era. Um, so several of these, excuse me, uh, local like mom and pop burger joints continue to operate down there. If you ever just cruise down 38th on Lincoln, you'll be like, oh, wow, there's a lot of like drive up and dine burger joints still down here. And I think perhaps the highest concentration per capita, I'm just making that up, but I'm guessing of of vintage burger joints in Tacoma is in the Lincoln district. And it wasn't just um, burgers and bowling that drew people to the area, but um, quite literally their, their health would sometimes find people in the Lincoln district. The most expensive building built in Tacoma at that time uh, was constructed in 1951 at a cost of $2 million. And it was the Mountain View Sanatorium which was built with the purpose of treating tuberculosis patients. Um, and so people that were suffering from tuberculosis would come here, uh, which was a new sort of reimagining of essentially what the Cushman Hospital had been for tuberculosis wards and had the most modern facilities of its type. And in 1958, it was absorbed by the Pierce County Hospital after the loss of the, the TB contract and became the Pierce County Hospital, which later became the Puget Sound Hospital. But today, right, Lincoln looks dramatically different in a lot of ways than what you would expect looking at these old timey photos. And I'm here to encourage you to look just a little bit deeper because so many of those iconic historic structures still remain in the Lincoln District today, not just Lincoln High, but um, you know a lot of the the former bank buildings, the the pharmacies. In fact, some of the pharmacies that are down there continue to be operated by the same families that they used to be, um, and, and, and restaurants and local businesses and grocers. All of those buildings remain down there, but they found new life and new revitalization. And like I said earlier on. In the, in the 1960s, what happens is um, there's this like vast exodus of people leaving the Lincoln neighborhood, and that frees up a bunch of affordable real estate for new people coming in, and it really explodes with this new multicultural population that now defines, I think, a lot of the character of the Lincoln district. But if you look past um, the like obvious like cultural identity that it now sports pretty, pretty evidently just through the art and everything. 
um, it's very much the same neighborhood that it ever was. It's a community driven and oriented place that tries to offer opportunities for, for people looking to bind together and create a stronger neighborhood. And that is pure, pure Lincoln iconicness. Uh, today, a lot of people associate the Lincoln neighborhood with that sort of East Asian identity, specifically with Vietnam. Um, the first Asian market that I'm aware of in Tacoma opened in the Lincoln district. Uh, again, in that time period there where there's this revitalization. And today, a lot of the best um, Vietnamese or Cambodian restaurants still exist in the Lincoln district down there today. And it becomes like a place where people go seeking that, that flavor and experience. And the revitalization of the Lincoln neighborhood that's happened over the last feels like a really long time, but it's really only been about three or four years now, um, <clears throat> has contributed so much, I think, to the preservation of this new identity, as well as keeping the Lincoln District a place that people want to continue to visit. And the, the art and the festivals and the excitement and the murals that are going on down there are really prevalent. And that's one of the things we always used to focus on when I would do the walking tours down there is that the entire story of Lincoln is really told through the street art and the murals that are down there. Uh, I think my favorite one is, I'm trying to remember where it is exactly, but it's this mural of essentially like salmon jumping through the sound. And each salmon is done in a different pattern to represent an, one of the cultural identities that resonates down there in the Lincoln district. Uh, so there's like a Samoan salmon and then a Puyallup designed salmon and a Vietnamese designed salmon down there. And so it's it's a really bold representation of the neighborhood as it is today that people often just kind of overlook, unfortunately. So yes, this is what I, I like to hear. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys Ah, go out and explore the the Lincoln neighborhood and get to get to see it for what it is right now and and spend some time down there because it's really absolutely extraordinary. And as you wander around, pay special attention to the buildings down there because a lot of them are iconic to the history and the story of the Lincoln neighborhood. And they have been, I'm going to call them cradles to this identity that the people of the Lincoln District continue to foster to this very day. So that's the best advice I can give you. Get on out there. Keep on exploring. If you guys have questions, comments, please let me know. I'm looking forward to our, our journey coming forward here. I know we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming up. If I'm checking my calendar here, oh, yeah. Our our next big thing that we're going to be talking about is the, um, the Asbury House. And we're about to release a lot of great content about the, the Japanese district that was in downtown Tacoma and sort of the history of its rise and fall. So look forward to that. It's all coming out very soon. I'm looking forward to hanging out with you guys. And maybe I'll even see you in person sometime soon. We can all dream, right? Thank you, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Have a great night.